Welcome to Book Me, Conversations with Writers, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing and Arts Nova Scotia. Today, our host, Costas Halabrezos, will be speaking with Linda Moore. Sherlock Holmes played the violin. Detective Philip Marlowe was an expert chess player. So, why shouldn't a sleuth named Rosalind devote much of her spare time to bringing new interpretations of classic theater works to the stage? Roz, as her friends call her, is a criminologist and the creation of Linda Moore. Before turning her hand to writing mysteries, Linda had built a long career in theater, including directing productions across Canada and a decade-long stint as artistic director of Neptune Theatre in Halifax. But, to the best of my knowledge, she's never solved a crime. Linda introduced us to the dramaturge with the urge to solve murders in foul deeds. Her latest mystery sees Rosalind settling into a quiet, rented cottage on the Bay of Fundy to spend her vacation working with a young troupe of actors on a production of excerpts from Samuel Beckett's works. But this plan is overturned by a gruesome discovery. Linda, welcome to Book Me. Thank you, Costas. How far back did you conceive of this wonderful hybrid character, Roz? You know, it was quite a long time ago, uh, but um, I and it just kind of spontaneously sprung from me, as I recall. It was one of those weird, obsessive kind of, you know, because the first one, the foul deeds one, is um, she's working on Hamlet. And there was a period where I was quite obsessed with Hamlet and trying to just kind of creating these parallels, it kind of arose naturally as I was beginning to write about someone who was working on on Hamlet and then her actual profession kind of came forward. So she kind of starts out as as uh, saying to herself that she's she's a dog's body. She just does everything for McBride, trying to make it all happen. It's very frustrating. And this then is a, her inspector sidekick. Her kind of, ins- uh, well, yeah, McBride, yeah, McBride's the gumshoe. Yeah. You know, he's the Philip Marlowe, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But um, it, it was really interesting because what happened was, I mean, Roz kind of evolves and becomes very good at actually sussing out what's going on. And she is able to to work on her work, which she's doing this production of Hamlet with this group of actors, but at the same time getting very drawn into this case and being more than an assistant, ending up actually solving the mystery. It, it's really an interesting juxtaposition. I mean, a, a person whose mind is is often occupied with pretty cerebral matters, you know, related to theater. But in this case, in this book, The Fundy Vault, she has to interact with the police and know how to gain the confidence of farmers and truckers and nurses in, in this rural community. How hard is it to pull that off in one character? I don't find it hard. <laughs> it just I mean, comes easy to you, you. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, you you go through it and you go through it and you go through it until you find sort of strike some credibility. But, but the she has her her very dear friend Sophie too, who, um, so that there's always that kind of comfort, uh, sort of back and forth banter relationship, and then she's got her cat, and so her cat is often her companion. And she's really, in a way, she's quite alone, but she does have these sort of key relationships. Could you read us an excerpt from The Fundy Vault? I would love to read you an excerpt from The Fundy Vault. I'll read you something from the early on part of the book. Okay. So that if people would like to read it or hear it, they won't feel like they've been, (laughs) like they, (laughs) oh, they already know what happened. Um, So I'm just reading uh, a little bit, I think, from the first chapter, actually. So Roz is, as you said, this is the second book I wrote. Roz is in, she's in Kingsport. She's renting a cottage. She's taking a break. And so she is just going out onto the beach and she sees something. And she uh, runs into someone on the beach and she says, We were facing south, and the sun was still climbing, just to the east of where we were looking. She put her hand up to shade her eyes and moved towards the water's edge. The crows were making a ruckus, circling the trunk, landing, flying. I do see something tangled there. But a person? No. 
I'd say that's a little far-fetched. I'd say it's floating plastic and garbage that's gotten caught in the roots. There's more and more debris out there these days, unfortunately. But the crows, well, crows are scavengers. They love garbage, don't they? Nice to meet you, Rosalind. Enjoy your stay. On we go. And carrion, they love carrion, I muttered as she continued towards the point, her two dogs frolicking ahead of her. Was she right? Was I just imagining an actual person caught there? I looked out across the water once again. I tried not to see them, but I could still discern human arms tangled into the dark roots. Pursuing this far-fetched notion was the last thing I wanted to do. I was here to escape, if only for a couple of weeks from the grim realities of crime. That was my plan, nature's beauty, Beckett, and lots of sleep. I threw my things into my rucksack and clambered up the ladders. I stood in the glassed-in porch, holding the shiny new blackberry I had purchased just before leaving Halifax. I wasn't sure where to start, but I decided to call the nearest fire department. The fellow who answered, Stan, asked if I was from the city, called me dear, and spoke at length about the tides. Six hours and thirteen minutes out, six hours and thirteen minutes in, he said. As to what I thought I had seen, he shared Grace's skepticism. He suggested I alert the RCMP if I was really concerned. Within half an hour, two young officers rolled up to my rented cottage. I watched them as they stood on the cliff's edge with their high-powered binoculars, trying to determine whether this was a wild goose chase. A stronger wind was now blowing from the east and had pushed the floating mass of branches around so its roots faced the opposite shore. This made it almost impossible to see the lower section of the trunk from where we stood. Constable Brad Cudmore lowered his binoculars and looked around. Pretty nice out here, eh? I nodded. He glanced over at his partner and then strolled off towards the cruiser. Clearly he was done. His partner, Corporal Riley Monaghan, a sparky young woman no taller than five feet, was showing more determination. She moved a few steps along the cliff's edge and looked again and then repeated the action. Come on, she said, encouraging the tree. Come on, turn a little, little more, just a little bit more. Oh, my sweet Jesus, she suddenly blurted. You're right. I think it's a person. A woman. Yup, you're right. I see her now. You can almost see her face. Take a look. She thrust her binoculars at me as the startled Constable Cudmore lurched up from the rear fender and hustled back towards us. I lifted the binoculars. Yes. There she was. The crystal clear image caught my breath. She had red hair, and her skin was so pale as to be almost blue, her arms reaching into the dark roots. She looked like Ophelia in the pre-Raphaelite drowning paintings, except her body was wound in what I now realized was neither a towel nor a sheet. Is that what I think it is? I wondered aloud. Corporal Riley Monaghan nodded. Yes, ma'am. You're not just whistling Dixie. That's an American flag. Well, <laughs> so... We have a mysterious death. Yes, uh, and a this body. Im- but this immediately <laughs> sets up this tension between two things that require total attention on their own. Uh, Roz had this plan to immerse herself in Samuel Beckett's short plays to prepare for working with the young actors. And the criminologist has this compulsion to find out why a dead woman is floating in the Minas Basin, wrapped in the Stars and Stripes. Tangled into like a... The roots of a floating roots tree. The roots of a floating yeah, tree. Yeah, yeah. Well, we see things like that, you know, uh, when we're when we're at the cottage in Kingsport, and it, of course, I've never seen a body, <laughs> but I mean, you can. It's that thing where you you're looking, and sometimes it's it's really confusing what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. So it kind of sprung from that, I think. Yeah, but you do have that tension then when she can never completely give her attention to the things she's supposed to be I know. paying attention to. I know, of course. Switching back and forth. It would come along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the crime would come along. Now, in yeah. your first Rosalind mystery, uh, as you mentioned, uh, she's involved in a production of Hamlet. What's the significance of choosing Beckett in the Fundy Vault? So what is the significance of choosing Beckett? I, I think it was it is partly that I myself personally uh, really feel connected to Beckett. And so I felt really free to explore it and interested in exploring it. And because I wanted the other action in the in, in the reason that she's going up there and she's invited these people up and they're going to work 
on something is that I actually did do Beckett work with Just in Time mm-hmm. Theatre. We did a production of Beckett. So there's something for me personally compelling about the work of Beckett and not for everybody, right? It's not right. everybody's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. But uh, And so then what happened was in this one, uh, she was working with this group of of, of actors, which are actually sort of the parallel to what Just in Time used yes. to be here in town. And then Sophie's there with her. So she actually asked Sophie to to read something, too, from Beckett. And so in the performance, in the actual performance, Sophie does read something, and I have it here. Oh, and it actually how t- convenient. I know, eh? <laughs> it just took me a second to find it. And it does tie into, um, in a way, with the imagery that we've been working with in the play, like mm-hmm. the fun, you know, the seeing of the tree and the woman in the tree and all of that. So Sophie comes and she reads, she sits down, the audience is there, there they've been doing their short works of Beckett, and she comes out and she sits down and here's what here's what she reads. It's just one paragraph. Um after footfalls, Sophie entered, placed her chair, and began to read the last section of A Joe. Her voice was so intimate, the audience was mesmerized. Soon she came to the final phrases. Lies down in the end with her face a few feet from the tide. Clawing at the shingle now. Finishes the pills. There's love for you, eh, Joe? Scoops a little cup for her face in the stones. The green one, the narrow one. Always pale, the pale eyes. The look they shed before, the way they opened after, spirit made light. See? He's a really good writer. So spare. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So spare. And some people will say really cryptic. Well, it is cryptic, but it seems to me to be very sort of shimmering mm. with with the image. Yeah. And and it tie, for me, when I found it, I thought it just ties right back to Ross seeing the woman in yes. the, you know in the tree and yeah. all that yeah. stuff. Right now, coming from theater, where there's yeah. lots of dialogue and some meaningful silences, uh, it, it's not surprising <laughs> that there there's a lot of dialogue and a minimum of connecting prose. I find yes. in, in your work. But but you're still directing as well. I mean, you're not just writing mysteries. In, in my life. In your life, yeah. yes. In, your, <laughs> as I'm supposed the, to in my life. The other half of your real life. <laughs> yes. Uh, has, the, has the thought process and, and the act of writing had any effect on the way you approach directing? Or are they completely separate? I think that the place where it joins is 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 with the written material, whatever the written material is. I think probably from working as a writer, I'm a little bit more tuned in sometimes to the material that I'm working with. Like that part of me can kind of, you know, overlap. Although, I mean, I, I've been involved with reading the writing of others for many, many years as a stage director. But it just kind of, um, I mean, although they feel like very separate things, they also feel complementary to each other. You have uh, what some mystery fans might find an unusual underlying theme for all the action in Foul Deeds and the Fundy Vault, protecting our water. Yes. T- tell us why you return to that. Yes. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I know. It, it's almost unconscious. And yet now I, when I look at it, I see that. I, I totally see that. You know, when one, it's the fracking and, and all the, the fracking water and, the, you know, the fact that in, mm-hmm. in the Fundy Vault, he's trying to find a place to hide. And and it, if you look online now and read about fracking, it is a huge problem where to store all this hundreds of thousands of water, which was once potable drinking water, gets contaminated and then has to be stored somewhere. But, yeah. but I mean, the other curious yeah. thing, I think, is the Fundy Vault was published in 2016. So yes. obviously you were writing it before that. But, but a CBC News report... In late January of 2019, and an article by, by Wendy Elliott in the Kings County Register suggests that life seems to be imitating your art. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I, I suppose it depends on, on uh, what happens there, up can, there. Can you tell us a, a bit about the, the real life thing that's been going on? Well, I, got a, I did get a, a, um, an email from Wendy Elliott saying that she was astounded that it reminded her of the Fundy Vault because in the Fundy Vault, it's, a, it's an American who comes up and, 
and sends hundreds and hundreds of trucks up to dump this contaminated fracking water into what are called vaults along that shore on the Minas Basin, and the Fundy it's a, it's shore. It's a geological feature. It's a geological feature where there's a big empty cave within the rock. And then it would run right out into the Bay of Fundy. So he was able to basically disappear all that contaminated fracking water, which just struck me as a kind of a nightmarish tale to tell, right? Mm-hmm. Of, mm-hmm. Because of how, how awful it is that so much good water is contaminated by fracking. Yes. And so then this whole idea that of someone near Walton, which is the other shore of the Minas Basin, which is the story that Wendy Elliott sent me, has bought, that purchased Halliburton, who were the people that were involved with the the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico yeah. and many other mishaps, um, have purchased this land in Nova Scotia near that coast of the Minas Basin, along where the 215 is, Walton is the is the community that it's near. And they are burying explosives there. Now, Halliburton, as it happens, and I found this out afterwards when I was looking them up, have been very involved in fracking as well. And it did make me wonder whether one of the – maybe it's not so much about storing explosives as it might again be about disposing of fracking water. Like there's still that possibility that that could happen. But what what kind of feeling did you have when you found – out that your book almost had this kind of prophetic <laughs> quality to it. I know. Well, yes, I mean, in a way, it's not surprising. I mean, but but I guess the, the awful part was that no one really seemed to know anything about it. And it's just kind of... Which felt, was the case in the novel, too. No, yes, the locals didn't really didn't know, know, except a few, except what was really who, going on. The one who was, who was yeah. benefiting. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, so it's kind of horrifying, Costas. I'm taking a wild guess that you have another uh, Rosalind mystery waiting in the wings. I think I do. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure yet uh, what it is. But uh, so we've got, we've covered sort of my connection with Shakespeare yes. in the first one. And now and in Fundy Ball, we've gone to Beckett. So the third one will be, I think, Sam Shepard. Uh-huh. Lie of the Mind, maybe. Um, uh, in Lie of the Mind, uh, there's a woman in a hospital that's been, she's been beaten up by Jake, this this character in Lie of the Mind. And so there's a whole thing there that's interesting to me about violence against women. But And then there's also, um, with Shepard, again, he he writes about more than what, what's on the page. I mean, there always feels to me to be a lot of depth and sort of symbolic depth in his work. So I'm not sure yet what's going to happen in that third book. But I've kind of written about eight pages. And uh, and it starts with um, Roz uh, trying to, finding that she's too depressed to even tur- turn on the late news. She's just feeling really depressed. And she usually really enjoys saying goodnight, Lloyd, but tonight she can't do that. And then she hears this noise and her cat gets all you know, edgy about stuff. She goes out into the dark and she walks across through uh, p- past her backyard and across over to the to the Cornwallis side there, Cornwallis Street, because she, of course, lives where I live. Roz lives <laughs> in my house, I guess. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and she uh, and she discovers and, and people are standing around and there's a, a dead deer there. So that's one of the, f- the first images that we that we have. And that's just in the first eight pages. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Less than eight, I think. Yes, than the first well, eight, I'm hooked so. and I'm sure your fans will be hooked by this one, too. Linda, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Costas. It's a great conversation. Thank you for joining us on Book Me. Much appreciated. Linda Moore is the author of the Rosalind series of mysteries. They include Foul Deeds and, most recently, The Fundy Vault. The audiobook versions of Linda's books can be purchased and downloaded from any of the following sites, audiobooks.com, audible.com or kobo.com. If you prefer to listen to the audiobook version at your local library, just ask a librarian for assistance in accessing the book you'd like. And to quote Rosalind in the Fundy Vault, librarians tend to be the most helpful people in the world. 
Book Me is sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. It's produced by Robin Grant. And Lynn Fox is our director of all things acoustic and digital. I'm Costas Halavrezos. Now, let's go read. Thank <laughs> you.